Collins, study of ancient times from the remains of art, implements, etc. And the scientific study of material remains such as tools, pottery, jewellery, stone walls and monuments of past human life and activities. So that's what archaeology is. So we're going to be digging up the past. But if it's all about the past, the next question would be, well, why would we bother with archaeology? It's all about old stuff. Most people are looking forward and looking into the future. Why would we bother with something old like archaeology? Well, archaeology can provide proof that things happened. It can tell us about how technology and engineering and building and medicine developed. It can tell us how civilizations developed and vanished, and there can be lessons for people in that. It can shed light on events that still impact us today. If we look at, for example, um, some of those previous lessons we might find from civilizations and perhaps how a war occurred or uh, how perhaps an earthquake took down a city. It can also tell us things about where we've come from and why we are the way we are. And it can provide, um, it can prove, sorry, specific events. And it can put you in touch with those events in a very tangible way. And that's why I said at the start, this is something that you can go and touch. You can walk into museums or you can walk onto archeological dig sites and you can actually dig this stuff up yourself or you can touch it sometimes in a museum. You can see it, you can get a sense of the scale, you can get a sense of the age, the color, the texture, how people might've used something. So it can be a very tangible um, event or item um, and it can really put you in touch with the past. I've got a little example of it myself, which is this here. You won't be able to see it necessarily there, but this is an example of a little bit of um, Roman masonry, and I picked it up on the, the Palatine Hill in Rome. Um, I was there with um, Uncle David Evans, actually, who some of you, um, probably all of you here in the hall will know, um, and we we're on the, the Palatine Hill, and we we're actually he said we were looking across to the Vatican and he said we're standing on one ruin looking across to where the next one will be. Um, and uh, yeah, I picked up this little piece of masonry and, and brought it home and it's something that, you know, it's touchable, you can feel it, you can look at it and go, well, that's how the Romans made their bricks. And it connects into really the whole Roman Empire and, and validates it um, for me. So that's just an example of the, the tangibility of, um, of archaeology. But we also talked about how it can prove that something actually happened. And uh, I just want to um, illustrate that a uh, little bit as well. Now, you might meet someone, say a farmer, and he might tell you a story about how back in the early 90s, so that's 30 years ago, um, that he bogged his tractor over in the back paddock and uh, he was miles from anywhere. And so he called up his neighbor to come over with his tractor to pull him out. And you might think, yeah, right, because, you know, how could you do that? There wouldn't be length enough on the, on the phone cable and these things hadn't been invented yet. So you might think, well, yeah, I'm not really convinced about that sort of a story. You could take it on face value and say, yeah, fair enough. But you might also have some doubts because you've got no evidence that anyone could technologically make that kind of a call. But then maybe one day you were at that farm and you're fossicking through the farmer's shed and uh, you found something in his shed. You might find this and you go, I wonder what that is. And you can start looking at that. For those who can't necessarily see it, this is what we're talking about. All right now, does anyone want to have a stab at what that is? Uh, a phone, you reckon? Who else? Anyone got any other guesses? Satellite. Maybe a satellite phone. Any other guesses on that? They did used to call them a brick. So we've got phone, sat phone and brick. Um, I think brick's probably the most accurate way of describing it. But yeah, this is a, a phone. Now, how might we know that that is from the era that we're talking about? Well, you can take the back off and there's a battery in it. And on the battery is a date. And the date says 1992. And it says it was checked off again in 1994. So there's a, a date there. And... Uh, Yep, it is a mobile phone, a very early mobile phone called a telecom walkabout. You can't even play snake on this one. You certainly can't browse the internet. Um, and it's very interesting to show how um, telephones and, and things have depreciated in value. On the bottom is a second-hand shop label for $350. 
On the front is an auction lot number where I bought it for five dollars. And it shows just how technology has moved on. But it also validates that story that actually in the early 1990s you could make a phone call from a bog tractor to get someone to help you out. And so what that does then is to say, well, OK, that farmer was telling the truth. And next time he tells me a story, I don't have really any reason to doubt because he's a truthful guy. And so that's just an example of how finding evidence um, can help to support a story that someone is telling or a record that you might be reading. And that's where archaeology and the Bible really come together. So what does archaeology do for the Bible? Archaeology provides evidence that things that the Bible talks about actually happened. By proving these things, archaeology lends credibility to the Bible. It helps make the Bible believable. It helps to show that the Bible is true. And for me, there's two key words in that, which is evidence and credibility. That's what archaeology does for the Bible. And just like finding a 1990s phone might support a story from 30 years ago, digging uh, evidence out of the earth or finding ruins or ancient records can support the stories that are contained in the Bible. But that leads to another question. Why would we want to prove that the Bible is true? And this is where it starts to get personal, and we'll consider this again at the end. We might want to prove the Bible true because it makes some big claims with far-reaching effects. Here's some of the things that the Bible says, and just consider them point by point and think about the magnitude of claims like this. The Bible claims that there is a God Think about that. But then it also says that God wrote the Bible. It says that God created the world. It says that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And it says that God promises eternal life. Now think about all of those sorts of things. Those are massive claims that impact all of us. They impact our lives. They impact the way the world is set up. They impact the direction that the world is going in. Think about all of those things. How can we validate that those things are true? And this is why we would want to prove the Bible is true. If we can prove the Bible is true, we prove that there is a God. We find that he's written to us in the Bible. We might want to find out what he's saying. We find out that God has created the world. Now that runs counter to a lot of what is said uh, in the world today. So there's various points that come out of the Bible that are really um, strong and significant for us. And um, so uh, this is why we would want to prove that the Bible is true. And archaeology is one means that we have to prove the Bible is true. And to me, one of the reasons to pursue archaeology. Now, archaeology won't prove every aspect of the Bible true, for sure. But it lends an enormous amount of credibility to the Bible. And along with fulfilled Bible prophecy, archaeology is one of the key reasons that I believe in the Bible. And so the key point to take away is this, that archaeology provides evidence and credibility for the Bible. Now, there's, there's so many archaeological um, discoveries that support the Bible. Numerous places mentioned in the Bible have been discovered, uh, places like Babylon and Nineveh. There's reference to numerous um, Bible characters that have also been discovered, both from the land of Israel and from countries and empires that were around Israel. There's also a lot that's been discovered about the culture and way of life of the times. Entire books have been written about the relationship between archaeology and the Bible. I've got um, one of them here. Um, that's called The Bible in the British Museum, Interpreting the Evidence. Um, and there's, I've got two or three of those British Museum style of books um, at home. They've been written over a number of years, um, but other works as well, which focus on the archaeology of the Middle East and its, uh, its relationship to the Bible. Now, some of the evidence that's presented there, it gets questioned. It's subject to ongoing study and interpretation. But there is cumulative evidence from archaeology that supports the Bible. And tonight, I want to share four archaeological discoveries that help in different ways to validate and lend credibility to the Bible, that help to prove that the Bible is what it says it is, the Word of God. 
So when we come to the worksheet, um, you'll see that um, here it says archaeological evidence for the Bible and I've put each of the four uh, items there and so for each one we'll see what it was, when it was discovered, where it was discovered and what does it prove about the Bible. So you'll be able to note down each point there um, as you go along. So the first one I want to have a look at Sorry, why we want to prove the Bible, we've looked at that. So the first one I want to have a look at is called Hezekiah's Tunnel. So what Hezekiah's Tunnel is, it's a water supply tunnel connecting the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam. It was discovered in 1625 and it was explored in 1838 and 1865. It's in Jerusalem. And what does it prove about the Bible? Well, it verifies the story that we read in our opening reading from 2 Chronicles 32, verses 1 to 8. It also verifies another verse in the Bible in 2 Kings 20. So this tunnel, it's 533 metres long. That's half a kilometre, or it's 1,749 feet for those who like that style of measurement. And it's been dated to the time of Hezekiah. And so if we look at our reading that we took tonight in 2 Chronicles 32, we find that Hezekiah is uh, he who was the king of the uh, nation of Judah, um, which is the southern part of the land of Israel, and he's faced with uh, invasion from the Assyrians. And so in verse 3, he is uh, realises that Jerusalem will come under attack and he takes counsel with his princes and his mighty men and they decide to stop the waters of the fountains which are without the city and they did help him. So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? So we've got these couple of verses here in the Bible that seems to indicate that they did something with the water course to stop the enemy getting their hands on the water. And so it was a strategic defensive move against the invading Assyrian army. And so Hezekiah's engineers and labourers um, did exactly what Hezekiah had planned and they tunnelled from the water course or the water supply, sorry, which is outside the city, which is called um, the Gihon Spring, and they tunnelled through the city um, into the Pool of Siloam and they diverted the water course um, so that it was now accessible without having to go outside of the walls. And uh, this diagram here shows um, where it ran from the Gihon Spring, which is out there um, to the right of the screen, coming all the way through um, to the Pool of Siloam, which is over there in the, the bottom uh, left corner of the city walls. And so you can imagine that that would have been quite an effort to do that. Um, it looks like they took advantage of a natural rock fissure um, that was in the, uh, in the, the geology there um, under the city, um, but they were able to bring that water through. And you might read that story and kind of go, no, okay, fair enough. Um, but, you know, ancient technology, probably didn't have dynamite, you know, how might they have got through and done that sort of a thing? Here's the evidence. The tunnel has been discovered. And uh, so you can say, well, there's Second Chronicles 32. That's, that's actually, we've got evidence that that event happened. It's also mentioned in Second uh, of Kings, um, Second Kings chapter 20. Second of Kings chapter 20 and verse 20. Uh, and this is summarising just at the end of Hezekiah's life. And uh, it's gone through a biography of uh, significant events and then it gets to the end and says, and the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And so this tunnelling and water diversion work is mentioned in Kings as well as in Chronicles. And here it is, the tunnel has been found. But not only that, um, later on, uh, after the discovery of the tunnel, um, in 1880, um, an inscription was found near the Pool of Siloam entrance um, to the tunnel. So 1880, this inscription was discovered. That's not the, the real inscription, that's a recreation, because someone thought there'd be value in this inscription and 
busted it off the wall and caused some damage to it and uh, fortunately it was discovered and it's now in a museum in Istanbul. Um, but that's a recreation of the plaque and it's back there. And it's been translated and you can see it's, uh, it's six lines long there. And this is the, uh, the translation. There's a number of translations but they all roughly turn out to be the same. So line one at the start, the tunnelling. And this is the narrative of the tunnelling. While the stone cutters were wielding the picks, each toward his co-worker, the picks each toward his co-worker, and while there were still three cubits to tunnel through, the voice of a man was heard calling out to his co-worker, because there was a fissure in the rock running from south to north. And on the final day of tunnelling, each of the stone cutters was striking the stone forcefully so as to meet his co-worker pick after pick. And then the water began to flow from the source to the pool a distance of 1,200 cubits. And 100 cubits was the height of the rock above the head of the stone cutters. And so we've read just three verses in the Bible that says they diverted the water course. But here, some additional evidence has been found that uh, tells us how that was done and has this idea of these two teams of rock cutters coming in from each end with their picks and working towards each other. And it talks about the moment here when they could hear each other coming and when they broke through the rock and the water started to flow. And you can imagine being in a besieged, or they weren't quite besieged, but a city that was at risk of, of invasion and being overrun and they knew they'd have to close up that city the sense of relief when they knew they'd secured their water source. And uh, so it's just really interesting when archaeology turns up something like this as able to shed additional light on the stories that we read here in the Bible. And I just thought that was just really interesting to um, get a sense of what it would have been like for those workers down there um, tunnelling through the rock and uh, to think about what it would have been like for them when they finally broke through. And so we've got evidence for the construction of this tunnel that's referred to here in the Bible. One thing that Hezekiah did at this time. But then we look and look then at other things that Hezekiah did. And we can go across um, into the later verses in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and look at the way that he encouraged the people. And we can look at his military setup in verse 6. Um, verse 5, he talks, it talks about building up the walls and he created... Uh, uh, new armaments, darts and shields in abundance. He set up a military structure with captains of war and he gathers the people together and he speaks comfortably to them and he gives them a, an encouraging speech, exhorting them to be strong and courageous and to be not afraid or dismayed for the king of Assyria. And he says there's more with us than with them. And he says they've got just an arm of flesh, but we've got the Lord our God to help us in verse 8. And the people were comforted and rested themselves in the words of Hezekiah. And so we can look at that and we go, well, he did the tunnel and he's done all of these other things, but eh, what actually happened? Well, we've got the evidence that he did the tunnel, so that can help us um, to have confidence that he would have done all of those other things as well. So the next item I want to talk about is the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is, this is great, I really like this one. So the Dead Sea Scrolls was discovered or the first scrolls were discovered in 1947 and they have or were cont continued to be discovered for quite a number of years um, afterwards. The scrolls were discovered in the Qumran caves which is, is at the northern end of the Dead Sea in Israel. Um, that's where the main discovery was made but then um, other caves all the way down the, uh, the coast of the Dead Sea there, the, the west coast down towards uh, Masada and even at Masada, um, there's been further discovery of, uh, of additional scrolls. What do these scrolls prove about the Bible? Well, the scrolls prove the accuracy of the text of the Old Testament. And this is a, just a, a really important discovery that was made in terms of the accuracy of the Bible. And uh, in these caves at Qumran, there were found these clay jars, um, and there's some that have been repaired and, and recreated there. Um, but these clay jars contain the earliest copies of the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, as we said, more and more scrolls were discovered in other areas down around the Dead Sea, including at Masada. And Masada is another example that we could have looked at tonight. That was the site of the last Jewish stand against the invading Roman armies. And the story goes that uh, a young Arab goat herder had lost a goat 
and he's looking for this goat and, and discovered some caves and he threw a rock into the caves and instead of just hearing the rock bouncing around, he heard the sound of shattering pottery and he thought, oh, I wonder what that is. And he was curious and, uh, and down he went and, and into the, the caves and he discovered the pottery jar that he'd broken and within it these scrolls and took some back to, uh, to his Bedouin family and they realised there might have been some value in them and sold them on to a, uh, an antiques dealer in, in Jerusalem. And it's just around about the time that Israel was established, so there was quite a lot of antagonism between the Jews and the Arabs, and it was uh, quite the story for archaeologists to get their hands on these scraps of, uh, of parchments um, to, uh, when they realised the value that potentially was in them. And that's um, just another story, if you're interested in a little bit of an adventure story, to work out how they actually got hold of all of the fragments. But when they started going through these uh, scrolls in depth, they realised that they, uh, they had entire books of the Bible in some cases. For example, they found an entire scroll of the, uh, the prophet of Isaiah. Um, and they found fragments of all of the Bible's Old Testament books except for the book of Esther. And these manuscripts were dated from between 325 BC and 70 AD. And uh, so they've come to be known as the Dead Sea Scrolls and comparing the text of those copies with the King James Bible, the version that Shem read from uh, in the introductory reading tonight, there are almost no differences despite there being well over 1,500 years between when the scrolls were written and when the King James Bible was first uh, published in 1611. And so what the Dead Sea Scrolls proved is uh, the fact that these writings, which lay claim to being God's word, as we've already said, have come to us virtually uncorrupted from the day that they were written. And these pictures show um, some of the, the fragments of scroll. That's just some examples of what the archaeologists were dealing with. So uh, on, the, uh, on the left there is what they found, and on the right is what they had to do to try and put it all back together. Um, and it's just been uh, ongoing work, um, and really it wasn't until into the, the 1990s that publication of some of the scrolls um, actually occurred, because it took so long to piece it all together and to work out um, what they had. Um, an example of, of some of the scrolls, they actually found those couple of scrolls there were made of copper, um, and they were... Uh, they had some directions towards where there was some buried treasure, um, but everyone, of course, has been to the locations and hasn't found anything. It was probably long gone, uh, but that was just a unique one. And then that one there is the, uh, the Isaiah scroll, um, so finding that complete book of the prophecy um, of Isaiah. And I just want to quote um, from Unger's Bible Dictionary um, what it says about the importance of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Unger's Bible Dictionary says, the Dead Sea Scrolls confirm the accuracy of the Old Testament text. The scrolls uh, push the date of the earliest known Old Testament scriptures back by about 1,000 years. And they say it is probably reasonably correct to say that there is at least 95% agreement between the various biblical texts found near the Dead Sea and the Old Testament that we have had all along. And they go on to say that even the differences that are there don't affect Bible teaching. And Ungers describes it as a miracle of preservation of the text in transmission. If you look at um, many other examples of uh, old texts of, of other ancient writings, Greek philosophers and writers like that, um, you don't normally get such accurate translation. And so we find from archaeology that the Old Testament that we read today is almost exactly the same as what the original writers wrote. We can trust that we've got the original message that was intended. We also get added weight to the authenticity of the prophecies contained in those writings, proof that they were not written after the event. So I don't think we can underestimate the importance um, of the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and what a significant archaeological discovery um, that was. The next example I want to have a look at is called the Tel Dan inscription, and this is uh, a more recent find. So the Tel Dan inscription, it's an inscription on a stella referring to the house of David. Uh, and you can see the definition at the bottom of what a stella is, an upright stone slab or column 
typically bearing a commemorative inscription or relief design, often serving as a gravestone. And uh, so one of these stellas was found at Tell Dan. It was discovered in 1993-94. That's because there's actually three parts to it, and those three parts were discovered across that date range. They were discovered in, in, right up in the north of Israel, um, north of the Sea of Galilee, uh, up into the area close to the Golan Heights. So it's right up in the, the, near the northern border of Israel. And what does it prove about the Bible? It proves the existence of uh, King David. Um, King David, as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, was one of the first kings of Israel. Um, and the Bible uh, covers a lot about King David, talks about important promises that God gave to him, talks about the way he set up the, uh, the kingdom. Um, it sets him up as uh, having a dynasty that, that carried all the way through. Um, Jesus Christ was, was in the line of, of King David. And so King David is a significant Bible character. And yet this discovery occurred at a time when the existence of David was being questioned by scholars. They were questioning whether he really existed and whether he could have been considered to be a king in the way that the Bible describes him. But this stella mentions not only David's name, but also the, it calls, um, it mentions David as having a house. It's not just David, it's the house of David, which points to the fact that he had a dynasty as well. So evidently he had some power and some longevity. He was not just some one-off minor ruler. And I just think it's really interesting that at a time when people were questioning whether David was even real, out of the ground comes evidence for this king and evidence for what he was like. Not just an individual who had the name of David, but someone who had a dynasty and a house um, who, and who was known um, and who would have had a level of power. And, uh, you know, we can perhaps think of um, archaeology as something that happened sort of, you know, a couple of centuries ago, if we look at some of the big discoveries of Babylon and Nineveh back in the 1800s. And yet the work of archaeology has continued on and even into um, a time which is, um, apart from perhaps the front rows, in the memory of uh, a lot of us, archaeology is still turning up evidence to prove the Bible. The next item I want to have a look at is called the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. Nothing to do with the fact I was blue and white striped pants. It's a type of rock and uh, this sets out the... Um, uh, it's an obelisk describing the military campaigns of the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III in the first 31 years of his reign. And uh, perhaps if I just go back to uh, the picture there, and you might be able to see that um, all up the side of the, the obelisk there is little panels that set out scenes. Um, it's probably not particularly easy to see, but I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. Um, and so there's these little carved reliefs all around on all four sides and, and going all the way up. And they show various military campaigns and the outcome of those military campaigns. Um, and then above each one, there's um, carved text in what's called cuneiform text. So not the sort of thing we'd be able to read ourselves. But each one sets out a description of what is shown in the relief. And so this is uh, really um, Shalmaneser III setting up a, a memorial to look at me, how good am I, look at what I was able to achieve. It was discovered in 1846, and it was discovered at a place called Nimrud, which is in northern Iraq. And you can see uh, on the map there is Baghdad in the middle, and Nimrud uh, up towards the north. It's a significant um, archaeological site, along with Nineveh, um, as one of the, the key cities um, of the Assyrian Empire. What does it prove about the Bible? Well, it proves the existence of King Jehu of Israel. And uh, his story is in 2 Kings chapter 9 um, and chapter 10. And this is Jehu of the furious driving. Jehu who, uh, yeah, was known for how fast he uh, was able to push his chariot and uh, 
and that's perhaps uh, one of those things that uh, is an appellation that not everyone would necessarily want to have and may have been preferred to be remembered for other things. But it's Jehu the furious driver. And this is who we've been uh, finding evidence of here in the black obelisk of Shalmaneser. And uh, Jehu is shown in this um, panel. So you can see there um, an example of what those carvings were like. Um, and you can see, I'm sure I can pick it up here, that's the, the cuneiform writing going across the top. Um, they have a special little tool called a stylus, which had it on the end of it, it looked like that thin end at one end, wide end at the top. And depending on how you impress that into the clay or carved it into the stone, that made the different letters. And that has been translated to give us evidence that this guy here is King Jehu of Israel. And so he's shown on that particular panel and the cuneiform inscription at the top um, in that area there circled in red says the following tribute of Jehu son of Omri silver gold a golden bowl a golden beaker golden goblets pitchers of gold lead staves for the hand of the king javelins I received from him and so here is um, Shalmaneser receiving tribute from King Jehu. Now, I called him Jehu the son of Omri. Jehu wasn't the son of Omri. He took down the dynasty of Omri, um, but the Assyrians' first contact with Israel would have been when Omri was the king um, or when Omri's dynasty was in power, and so they recognised him as that sort of perhaps primary um, uh, king of Israel and connected all the other kings back to him. And so there's a reference there to uh, to King Jehu and uh, this carving here is the only known depiction that's been found of an Israelite king. Uh, it's one of several references in the annals of Shalmaneser to King Jehu and it demonstrates the alliance of Jehu and Assyria at a time when the Syrians and Assyrians were rivals. And uh, if we're in 2 Kings chapter 10, um, we can find a little reference to sec uh, in this to, to 2 Kings um, chapter 10. And we find in verse uh, 31 that Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So he wasn't a follower of God, even though God had used him to uh, take down the dynasty of Omri and also destroy Baal worship um, in Israel. And then in verse 32, in those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short and Hazael smote them in all the coasts of Israel. And uh, Hazael was the king of Syria. And we find that um, the Syrians had been at war with the Israelites even before the time of Jehu. And uh, so we can find, we see there then that the, um, the alliance was between Israel and Assyria uh, and you can find further evidence in fact the Tel Dan Stele has some references to it uh, in other parts of that that's been translated that shows that there was antagonism between the Syrians and the Assyrians we find here in second chronicles that the Syrians were attacking Israel and we find here on the obelisk that Jehu was uh, if not in alliance in subservience to uh, to the Assyrians but that's certainly where his uh, allegiance was and uh, the Syrians were down there trying to attack him um, and were quite successful at it as we see from um, from second kings and so further evidence there with the the black obelisk that's quite impressive I've seen that one and um, to be able to to point to that character and go there's evidence uh, to be looking at it and going that's the Bible right there and it's been dug out of the ground and translated and they say that's King Jehu and so there's a real Bible character um, being portrayed there as a result of an archaeological discovery and so you can read those chapters knowing that this is not just some legend that somebody's made up we've got evidence to show that these were real people and we've got uh, further evidence from the broader historical context that shows that the alliances line up correctly here and it's all been because of what's been discovered in archaeology. Now, there's another interesting archaeological link to Jehu that's been discovered as well, and that's called intentional 
desecration. Another question, does anyone want to have a stab at what that is on the screen? Except for my kids. Yep, Kit? Not Kit, sorry, Luke. Uh, keyhole. Keyhole, any other guesses? Ruth? No. Sorry? A toilet. a toilet, okay. So we've got a keyhole, we've got a toilet. Any other guesses, Kit? Uh, like a crucible, one of those things you're not meddling. Okay, yeah, it's another guess. Any other guesses out there? Rihanna's got a cheeky grin on her face because Ruth is right. That's a toilet. And uh, it was found in the middle of a destroyed temple. It seems that if you really wanted to pay the ultimate insult to another country's God and really offend the worshippers and put them off returning to the site, you would put a toilet in it. And this comes out of the story of Jehu's destruction of Baal worship in Israel. While we've got 2 Kings open, let's have a look at verses 26 and 27. 2 Kings 26 and 27, talking about the destruction of Baal. Um, they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draft house unto this day. And when you look at what draft house means, it, uh, it means it was a sewer. Um, there's similar references in Daniel where it talks to houses, it talks about uh, houses being broken down and made a dunghill, um, and that has the idea of, of it being a drain or a, or a sewer um, as well. And so the, the quote that I found there in relation to that, the practice of desecrating a holy site by setting up a toilet in it is attested in antiquity, and this is likely what Jehu did to the temple of Baal. Um, they haven't found one in Samaria where the house of Baal likely was, um, but there was one found when they, were, when they found some evidence of Hezekiah's religious reforms um, in Lachish, and that discovery was only in 2016. Um, there a gatehouse, or sorry, a gate shrine was discovered, along with two four-horned altars that had their horns intentionally broken off. Within the shrine, excavators also found a toilet, evidence of intentional desecration. Based on the biblical description, Jehu did something similar at the Temple of Baal at Samaria. And it just shows the variety of archaeological evidence that's out there that supports the Bible. Um, and yeah, I thought that was just a, a point of difference, um, again, to show that sort of range of things. You can dig up an entire city, you can find writings, um, you can find statues, or you can find a toilet. Um, and there's the evidence there that they turned it into a draft house. And so we've, they've found not particularly evidence of that story, but the fact that it was a known practice um, and just further evidence backing up um, the facts that are recorded here in the narrative. It wasn't just something, again, a legend that someone thought, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we said they did that? Well, actually, no, they did. We found the evidence of it. So tonight we've looked at Hezekiah's tunnel, we've looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've looked at King David, and we've looked at King Jehu. And it's just a handful of examples but it's a broad cross-section of the evidence. Evidence for the text of the Bible, evidence of the places and events of the Bible, and evidence for the characters of the Bible and what they did. And so what does archaeology do for the Bible? It provides a whole lot of credibility to the Bible. It makes the Bible believable. If I go back to the story I mentioned at the start about um, standing on the Palatine Hill with Uncle David and him talking about looking across to where the next ruin would be, how could he confidently make a statement like that? Well, it's because the Bible is credible and the evidence provided by archaeology is one of the reasons for that. He's quoting a prophecy there, a prophecy from Revelation, but there was enough confidence from other evidence to say, yep, that's going to happen. And there we were standing on an archaeological site um, when that comment was made. And archaeology, as we've seen, providing that evidence and confidence to make those kinds of comments. So if we go back to those um, claims of the Bible that we looked at back at the start, why would we want to prove the Bible true? Because of the claims it makes, claims that there is a God claims that God wrote the Bible, 
claims that God created the world, claims that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that God promises eternal life. Are those claims valid? Well, when we look at the evidence for the Bible overall that is provided by archaeology, we can say that yes, they are valid and worthy of further consideration. We're not left without hope in this world and we're not left without evidence that gives credibility to that hope. So for us, what should we do? Well, we've seen archaeology supports the validity of the Bible. Its claims are valid and worthy of further consideration. We've seen that we're not left without hope in this world. I'm sure the events of the last couple of years have left many people wondering, what's the point of everything? Um, is there any hope given all the events that are going on? Where's it all going to go next? It just seems to be continually going downhill. And yet, the Bible holds out hope and uh, archaeology, the discoveries of the archaeologists give credibility to that hope. And so what sort of reaction might we want to take to this? Well, we, we could ignore it. We could just say it's just interesting little bits and pieces that have been dug out of the ground, but there isn't really any meaning. Um, but if we're considering archaeology and going, well, actually, can't really deny that this is providing evidence for the truth of the Bible and the Bible's made some pretty big claims what should my reaction to that be well don't ignore what the Bible is trying to tell us don't ignore the evidence that supports the Bible investigate further um, these examples from archaeology see what else you can find there's there's plenty out there um, plenty of things that, that you can have a look at Plenty of characters that have been discovered, lots of, uh, lots of kings, lots of empires. Um, you can look at things that have been discovered in Rome, in Babylon. Um, plenty of other things that are out there that you can say, well, this is a story like Daniel or a story like Jonah. The cities in which those places, um, uh, the cities in which those events occurred have been discovered um, and they're real. You can, you can look at it and go, you can, I can imagine Daniel walking through here. I can imagine Jonah walking around this city of Nineveh. So investigate further, come up with some more evidence for yourself. And then um, investigate and, uh, and look at the message of the Bible for yourself. Um, look at those claims that the Bible has made. Look at the uh, additional verses that are there in the Bible. And it's, there's themes there that are consistent right through the Bible, um, which talk about God's purpose with the earth that talk about the promises that God has made through people like Abraham, through people like David, who we've looked at tonight. Um, and we can look at then how the gospel was developed, the life of Jesus Christ, how Jesus Christ was killed and rose again, how we can be reconciled to God and have our sins forgiven. All of that is in the message of the Bible. And you can find out just by reading and continuing to look through it. And you can read it having confidence that it's a real message, that it's true. Uh, that it's not just some legend or story that somebody's made up because we've got evidence for it. We've got the archaeology. There's other evidence that we can look at as well. But archaeology is one of those things that when you're reading through these stories, you can say, yep, we've, uh, we've found evidence of where those sorts of things happened and what it was like at those sorts of times. And so to investigate the message of the Bible for yourself, it, uh, it will give you the same purpose uh, and direction it's uh, for me, I found um, the evidence of, of archaeology is one of the reasons to believe that the Bible is credible and trustworthy. And personally, I find their purpose and direction in life. And so I'd encourage all of you to be looking at it yourself, using the evidence that you've got uh, and looking for that same purpose and direction. Thanks, everyone. We would like to...